There's a lot of exciting things happening in the design world and at IDEO this past year, and I'm pleased to get a chance to share some of those um, with you. Um, I've, I didn't attend the first TED back in 1984, but I've been to a lot of them since that time. I thought it was kind of be interesting to think back to that time uh, when Richard got the whole thing started. Thank you very much, Richard. It's been a big, enjoyable part of my life coming here. And, um, and so I was thinking back, I was thinking those of us in Silicon Valley were kind of really focused on products or objects, certainly technological objects. And so um, it was great fun in those days, and some of those, of those of you who are in the audience were my clients, and we'd come in with some uh, prototype underneath a black cloth, and we'd put it on the conference table, and we'd pull off the black cloth, and everybody would ooh and ah, and um, that was a really good time. And so we'll continue to, to focus on products, as we always have, but um, we're and if you were here last year, you probably, uh, I probably uh, wrestled you to the floor and tried to show you my new iModule 2, which was a camera that plugged into the handspring. And I took, I took a lot of pictures last year. Very few people knew what I was up to, but I took a lot of pictures. And this year, maybe you could um, show the slides. And this year, we're carrying this trio, which we uh, had a lot to do with and helped Handspring design it. And also, although we designed it a few years ago, it's just become ubiquitous in the last year or so, this HeartStream defibrillator, which is saving lives. Maybe you've seen them in the airports. They seem to be everywhere now. Lots of lives are being saved by those. And we're just about to announce the, um, the Zinio uh, Reader product that, that I believe will make magazines even more enjoyable to read. So we really will continue to focus on products, but something's happened in the last 18 years since Richard started TED, and that's that people like us, I know people in other places have caught on to this for a long time, but for us, um, we've really just started to get, we've kind of like climbed Maslow's hierarchy a little bit, and so we're now focused more and more on kind of human-centered design, human-centeredness in an approach to design. And that really involves designing like behaviors and personality into products. And I think you're starting to see that and it's making our uh, job even more enjoyable. Um, interesting, interestingly enough, we used to primarily build um, 3D models, you know, like you've seen some today, and, um, and 3D renderings and we'd go and we'd show those as uh, communicating our ideas. But firms like ours are having to move to, to a point where we get those objects that we're designing and get them in motion, um, showing how they'll be used. And so uh, in order to do that, we've been forming uh, internal uh, video production groups in order to make these kind of experience prototypes that show just what we mean about the kind of man-machine relationship. And it's, uh, it's a much better way to see. It's kind of like you know, architects who show people in their houses as opposed to them being empty. So I thought that um, I would show you a few, a few videos to kind of uh, show off this new broader, um, uh, broader definition of design in uh, products and services and environments. Um, I have a few of them. They're no more than a minute or a minute and a half a piece, um, but I thought you, you might be interested in seeing some of our work over the last year and how it um, responds in video. So Prada New York, we were asked by Rem Coolhouse and OMA to help us conceive um, the technology that's in their retail store in New York. He wanted uh, a new kind of store, a new one, a store that had a cultural role as well as a retail one. And <clears throat> that meant um, actually designing custom technology as opposed to just buying things off the shelf and putting, putting them to use. So there's lots of things. Everything has RF tags. There's RF tags on the user, on the cards. There's these staff devices that are all around the store. You pick them up, and once you see something that you're interested in, the staff person can scan them in, and then they can be shown on any screen throughout the store. You can look at color and sizes and how it appeared on the runway or whatever. Right, and so um, then the object, then the uh, merchandise that you're interested can be scanned. It's taken into the dressing room, and in the dressing room there are scanners so that we know exactly what uh, clothing you have in the dressing room, and we can put that up on a on a touch screen, and you can play with that and get more information about the clothing that you're interested in uh, as you're trying it on. It's been used a lot of places, but I particularly like the the uh, use here of liquid crystal 
uh, displays in the changing room. It was the last time I went to, to see this store, there was a huge buzz about people standing outside wondering, am I going to actually get to see the people changing clothes here? And, uh, but if you push the button, of course, the, the whole wall goes, goes dark. So you can uh, try to get approval or not for whatever you're wearing. And then one of my favorite features of the technology is the magic mirror, where uh, you put on the clothes, there's a big display in the, uh, in the mirror, and you can turn around, but there's a three-second delay, so you can see what you look like from the back or all the way around as you do it. About a year and a half ago, uh, we were asked to design the, um, an installation in the museum. This is a new wing of the Science Museum in London, and it's primarily about digital and uh, biomedical issues. And um, a group at Itch, which is now part of IDEO, um, designed this interactive wall that's about four stories tall. I don't know if anybody's seen this. It's pretty spectacular in the room. Anyway, it's based on the London subway system, and so you can see that these are, uh, the, the goal was to bring some of the feedback that the people who had gone to the museum uh, were giving and get it up on the wall so everybody could see, to, for everybody to see. So you enter your information, and then like this London tube system, the little trains go around with your, uh, what, you're, what you're thinking about, and then when you get kind of to a station, it's uh, expanded so that you can actually read it. Then when you, you exit the IMAX theater on the fourth floor, uh, mostly teenagers coming out of there, there's this big open space that has these tables uh, in it that have interactive games, which are quite fun, also designed by Durrell and Andrew of Itch. And uh, the, topics, um, the topics include um, things that the museum is about, uh, male fertility, choosing the sex of your baby, or what a driverless car might be like. There's lots of room so people can kind of come up and kind of understand what it is before they get involved. And also, it's not shown in the video, but these are very beautiful. They go to the top of the wall, and when they kind of reach all the way to the top after they've bounced around, they kind of disperse into bits and kind of go off into the atmosphere. The next video is not done by us. This is a CBS Sunday Morning that aired about two weeks ago. And, uh, Scott Adams ran into us and asked us if we wouldn't help to design the ultimate cubicle for Dilbert, which sounded like a fun thing, and so uh, we couldn't pass it up. He's always been interested in kind of technology in the future. I realized that at some point I might be the world's expert on what's wrong with cubicles. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to get together with some of the smartest design guys in the world and try to figure out if we could make the cubicle better? Though they work in a wide open office space, spectacularly set under San Francisco's Oakland Bay Bridge, the team built their own little cubicles to fully experience the problems. Yeah. A one-way mirror. I can look at it, you can look at yourself. <laughs> they took pictures. You feel so trapped, you know, and someone kind of leans over and you're sort of like held captive there for a minute. So far it's chaos, but a lot of people are doing stuff, so that's good. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. The first group builds a cubicle in which the walls are screens for the computer and for family photos. In the second group scenario, the walls are alive and actually give Dilbert a group hug. Behind the humor is the idea of making the cubicle more human. So here's the final thing complete with kind of orange lighting that follows the sun across, follows the tracks of the sun across the, uh, the sky, so you feel that in your, um, in your cubicle. Um, and my favorite feature, which is a flower in a vase that wilts when you leave in disappointment, and then when you come back, it kind of comes like up to greet you and the, uh, happy storage. to see you. It's like built right into the wall. You know, there's homey touches like a built-in um, fish tank in the walls or something to be aggressive with to I see release this tension. Is customizable for the, uh, the boss of your choice. And of course a hammock for your afternoon nap that for stretches Dilbert, across your says cubicle. his creator. Life would be sweet in a cubicle like this. Uh, this next project we were asked to design a pavilion to celebrate the recycling of the water on the Millennium Dome in uh, London. The dome has an incredible amount of water that washes off of it, as well as wastewater. 
So this building actually celebrates the water as it comes out of the recycling plant and goes into the reed bed so that it can be filtered for the final time. The pavilion's de design goal was to be kind of quiet and peaceful. Uh, in contrast to if you went inside the dome where it's kind of wild and crazy and everybody's, um, you know, like learning all kinds of things or fooling around or whatever they're doing, but it was uh, intended to be quite quiet. And then you would wander around and gather information in a kind of a straightforward fashion about, uh, about the recycling process and what's being done and how they're going to reuse the water once it comes uh, through the plant. And then the pan, if you saw, I'm sure said the panels actually rotate so you can uh, get information on the front side, but as, as they rotate, you can see the actual recycling plant behind with all the machines as they actually process the water. There you can see, there's the, there's the plant. These are all very low budget videos, like quick prototypes. So we're announcing a new product here tonight, which is the first time this has ever been shown in public. It's called Spyfish, and it's the, a, a company called H2I, started by Nigel Jagger in London. And it's a company that's trying to uh, bring the experience. Many people have boats or uh, enjoy being on boats, but a very small percentage of people actually um, have the capability or the interest in going under the water and actually seeing what's there and enjoying the, what scuba divers do. This product is, has two cameras. You throw it over the side of your boat and, it, um, and you basically scuba dive without getting wet. <laughs> For us, this, there's the object. For us, it was a kind of two projects. One to design the interface so that the interface doesn't get away in your way. You can have that kind of immersive experience of being underwater, of feeling like you're underwater, seeing what's going on. And the other one was to design the object and make sure that it was, uh, it, it was a consumer product and not a research tool. And so we spent a lot of time. This has been going on for about seven or eight years, this project, and uh, just ready to start building them. The Spyfish is a revolutionary subaquatic video camera. It can dive to 500 feet to where sunlight does not penetrate and is equipped with powerful lights. It becomes your eyes and ears as you venture into the deep. The battery-powered Spyfish sends the live video feed through a slender cable. This slender cable is a huge deck, technological a advancement and takes allowed the whole thing to be the size that it is. And the central box connects the whole system together. Maneuvering the Spyfish is simple with the wireless remote control. You watch the video with superimposed graphics that indicate your depth and compass heading. The fluid graphics and ambient sounds combine to help you completely lose yourself underwater. And the last thing I'll talk about is Apratech, which is a project I'm very excited about. Apratech is a company started by Dr. Martin Fisher, who's a good friend of mine. He's a PhD from Stanford. He found himself in Kenya on a Fulbright. And he had a very interesting insight, which is that he said, there must be uh, entrepreneurs in Kenya. There must be entrepreneurs everywhere. And he, he noticed that for, for weddings and funerals, they could find enough money to put something together. And so he decided to start manufacturing products in Kenya with Kenyan manufacturers designed by people like us, but um, taken there. And to this date, he's been going for only a few years, he started 19,000 companies. He's, he's made 30,000 new jobs. And just the products, the sales of the products, that this is a nonprofit, that the sales of this products is now 0.6% of the GDP of Kenya. This is one guy doing this. This is a pretty spectacular thing. So we're in the process of helping them design uh, deep well, low cost manual pumps in order for these people who have like a little, like a quarter acre, 
of land to be able to grow crops in the off season. What they do now is they can grow crops in the rainy season, but they can't grow them in the, in the off season. And so by doing that, uh, the uh, woman that you saw in the first thing now is uh, always, she's a school teacher, always wanted to send her kids to college and she's going to be able to do it because of these things. So with seed squeezers and pumps and hay balers and kind of very straightforward things that we're designing, my students are doing this as class projects and IDEOs uh, donated their time to do this kind of work. And so it's really amazing to see, um, to see his success, Martin's. So I also, we also were thinking about the experience of Richard. And so we designed this hat because I knew I'd be the last one in the day and I, would, I needed to deal with him. So I just have one more thing to say. <laughs> Can you read it? <laughs> Well, it's always kind of funny when he comes up and hovers, you know, you don't want to be rude to him and you don't want to feel guilty. And so I thought just this would do it where I just sit here and <laughs> So we, we saw a lot of interesting things being designed today in this session and um, from all the different presenters and in my own practice from uh, from Prada to Apritech, um, it's really exciting that we're um, taking a more human-centered approach to design, that we're including behaviors and personalities in the thing we do, and I think this is great. Designers are more trusted and more integrated into the business strategy of companies, and um, I have to say, for one, I am um, very feel very lucky that the progress that design has made since the first TED. Thanks a lot.